All right. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us or me in this talk. Uh, it's called Fuzzware, Using Precise MMIO Modeling for Effective Firmware Fuzzing. This was a joint work between um, different people from Ruhr University Bochum over in Germany, but as well in Amsterdam and uh, the SEC lab at UCSB in uh, California. All right, so let's give a little bit of an overview of what we are trying to achieve with this kind of direction of research. So what we are trying to do is we just taken a firmware image from somebody. We may not even have the device and we may not have uh, any emulator that's already working uh, in a full blown state, but we still want to get out some bugs in there and we want to perform dynamic analyses. We want to run this firmware, but we do not actually have uh, the hypervisor around it. As we have seen in this previous talk, we were attacking the hypervisor in the previous talk, but in this one, we are actually trying to run and find bugs within the firmware that is running. Um, so let's first synchronize on what we're actually talking about uh, within this uh, firmware domain. It's very large. And many of you, depending on your background, may associate uh, an embedded system with something like a router, for example. But as it turns out, routers use um, Linux a lot of time, like a Lizzybox Linux, for example. And uh, it turns out for these types of embedded systems, we can actually use off-the-shelf tools uh, reasonably well. Um, but there is also a whole different uh, area of devices. And uh, examples of these are, for example, um, programmable logic controllers, which, would, which you would find for automation in factories, or an ECU, which is deployed within a car. And what these types of devices have in common is that they do not actually run Linux, and they don't have these nice abstractions that we can use, something like AFL or Lipfuzzer. And, uh, but we still want to perform some security analysis of these because in the end, uh, they are running our critical infrastructure in an electric grid and production plants and so on. So the safety and security is very important. And um, when looking at how these differences kind of manifest uh, between the two types of systems, we can first look at an example from a Linux-based functionality. And this is a function that just simply gets in uh, one byte of serial input. And as we can see, what we can do on a Linux system is to basically just use a syscall, a read syscall, for, and which reads uh, from standard in, and uh, Linux will just give us one byte of input in here. And it's pretty straightforward, so we can uh, get this input byte. Um, when we look at this same um, kind of functionality, which also gets in one single byte of input on an um, bare metal system, which is doesn't run Linux, then uh, we can see that this gets much more complex. And in here, for example, uh, we require the firmware to perform some excesses on the hardware. And we have seen this in the previous talk, uh, which introduced MMIO already, or memory mapped input output, where we have some um, memory range, which is not actually backed by memory, but by a virtual, uh, or by a device uh, instead. And here, what we can see, for example, is that uh, we would need to ask uh, the hardware whether some data is available in the first place. And before there is no data available, we cannot re really read anything. So we perform a while loop on this. Um, then we might uh, want to indicate to the user by blinking an LED that some activity is going on. You might uh, have seen this on some um, boards before, um, which also involves talking to the hardware, so additional MMIO accesses. And then, of course, what we need to do is uh, to get the actual um, data and it takes like three different MMIO accesses, some in the loop, uh, to just get out one byte of input. Um, and if we look at uh, this MMIO, what we can do in a very simple approach would be to have an emulator running, uh, which just takes in this uh, firmware and just starts running it. And whenever we uh, encounter one of these MMIO accesses, then we can just have a fuzzer provide some input to this MMIO. And uh, one of the interesting properties of this type of setup is that we do not actually need the real hardware, uh, but we can uh, run this on general purpose computational resources, just spin up some cloud instances and scale it up to um, high performance uh, clusters, for example, which makes it very scalable. Um, and we want to kind of talk about this in the context of this example, uh, what this might entail and uh, how this 
approach might not be uh, quite feasible to uh, perform meaningful testing um, as it is. And uh, to look at this, we can see on the left side um, a piece of code which basically uh, takes in some hardware input from the MMIO operation register of a perf specific peripheral. And then based on uh, what this peripheral state is, we want to uh, do some housekeeping, for example, in this one case, uh, or uh, handle a specific value in another case, or do some other computation. And as we can see in this B case, the third one, um, here we actually have a second MMIO access and a decision based on this MMIO status, we might want to do some special or some default handling in here. And uh, we can click through this uh, to visualize this a bit. Um, and then uh, what we can uh, do is to um, visualize how this would work from a fuzzing perspective. So if we look at um, these slots over at the top, this could represent our input space. So we have 16 different values that the fuzzer could choose. And what a fuzzer like AFL would do is basically resolve to some uh, randomness in their input. And if we um, pick some of those uh, values at random, let's say 16, uh, we can see what kind of values we hit. Um, and in this case, we can see A was hit one time and uh, the other one was uh, hit quite a bit as well. So we hit the default case uh, in a lot of cases, which is indicated in this uh, dark green. And then uh, we uh, hit the, uh, the B case in no cases, which is the right one, and then A in the light green. But what we can see is that we kind of leave out one of the regions and uh, because it's grayed out here, um, we also miss the bug that could potentially lie within there. And the general issue that we're facing here is that the fuzzer just has too many choices. So this kind of gets us to a paradox where uh, we would like the fuzzer to be able to uh, explore all this state space of uh, this firmware image, but at the same time, uh, we want it to be uh, not overwhelmed and have, has to um, spend too many mutations and tries uh, just uh, without getting any, any effects. And uh, so this is where our work uh, kind of goes in, is where uh, we add a modeling step that uh, is trying to um, eliminate all the choices or boil down the choices for the fuzzer and represent it in a very accessible way so that the fuzzer doesn't have to uh, just guess its way uh, through a too large input space. And uh, we can kind of visualize this as well. So if we look at this piece of code again, what we have is that we have a switch case statement over an A case, a B case, and then uh, the default case. And as it turns out, all the firmware actually cares about is whether uh, uh, the hardware peripheral indicates it to be in one, one of three cases and not the whole state space of 16 in this example, which is on a real computer, obviously, even much larger and hard to test for um, the fuzzer exhaustively. So instead, what we can do uh, by having in mind that we only have three cases, the A case, the B case, and then a third one, which we could call the C case, then we can actually, for the fuzzer, remove all these different choices and just uh, boil it down to three. And uh, if we can actually step through this where we say each of these uh, excesses would be uh, then discoverable by the fuzzer just choosing between one of three options, as we can see here. And uh, in the B case, where we can see we have a second MMIO access, keep in mind, and it turns out we can do this recursively as well. So for every one of these choices, we can do the modeling again. And uh, this makes it very easy for the fuzzer to guess the special value, which might be one in four billion, for example, on a, uh, in a, a real firmware image, but if we pre-compute these uh, two values representing these different states, then it's only two. And it turns out the fuzzer is able to much more easily cover a lot of the, the surface here. And as we can see, the buggy path is also easily coverable, and this allows the fuzzer to uh, uncover bugs in here as well within the firmware. Um, and this brings us to the results. Uh, so first of all, we measured the input space reduction, which is comparing the, uh, the amount of choices that the fuzzer had before our modeling and before boiling it down and then 
the amount of choices that the fuzzer has after our modeling. And it turns out we can get rid of uh, around 95% or up to 95% of the choices that the fuzzer would normally have to go through and try out. Um, we also measured the cover me coverage that we could uh, get uh, via this approach and uh, comparing it to other work, uh, we get a up to a 3x improvement in the coverage that we have observed. And then finally, to show some real-world impact, we also fast tested the um, network stacks of different IoT operating systems and we found uh, 12 CVEs or 12 bugs leading to the assignment of CVEs in uh, both Zephyr OS, which is a real-time operating system, and Contiki OS as well. And with that, I'm open to questions. <laughs>